How to increase your vertical, specifically how to increase your vertical for volleyball. At the recent UK Strength and Conditioning Association annual conference, I sat down with Jeremy Shepard. Jeremy is an expert in the field of strength and conditioning with a wide background in many sports, amongst them volleyball. Not only is Jeremy a coach, he also has published quite a bit of research on the topic vertical, plyometric and so on. So I've taken the opportunity to talk to him and ask him a few questions about how to increase your vertical and how to do plyometrics and appropriate plyometric training progressions. Jeremy explains how he uses a jump profile and what a jump profile is, how he analyzes individual demands of the athlete so the athlete can work on what he or she needs to improve, appropriate plyometric training and plyometric training progressions for each athlete, Jeremy also explains what he means with athlete-specific, sport-relevant, and coaching cues he uses to improve the vertical. Video was taken in between sessions slash lectures, so there's a bit of background noise in the beginning, but later on that background noise will be, go will be gone. So, enjoy. Okay, today I'm here with Jeremy Shepard. Jeremy Shepard is the lead coach at the Canadian Institute of Sport for Snowboarding nowadays. Wide background, uh, previously head of sports science surfing Australia. Um, before that, volleyball and beach volleyball and mentored by Ispan Bali with that Balji. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. So in if you don't the, know who Ispan Balji is, look it up. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, that is. in the 90s, yeah. So today's topic will be touching on your experience with volleyball and beach volleyball and the general question is how do you get a higher vertical jump? Cool. So looking at um, implementation of plyometrics, how would you go through planning a plyometric program mm -hmm. and over cool. to you. Sweet. Um, so volleyball is a great context obviously because um, as a strength conditioning coach you you know in some sports you're 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 sort of torn in a bunch of different directions on what you can affect performance with and what I love about working with volleyball players is there are though there are many things that you can help with there's really one that just stands out and is is, is just so important and that's the the speed of their movement on court and their vertical jump and, and and if you can improve their vertical jump you tend to also improve their speed quality so they're not really competing with each other um, so a vertical jump for a volleyball player is, is king, and, uh, and and it's what you're looking for. And one of the things that I, I think is important to remind people of is um, they, they often see impressive vertical jumps from short people, and then they assume that tall volleyball players cannot have a vertical a good vertical jump or do not. And maybe a, a tall kid, a 15, 16 year old, because they've done a lot of growth, doesn't have a very impressive vertical jump. But a tall man or a tall woman they actually have a longer push distance through their vertical jump. So as they mature and they get used to how tall they are, so to speak, and they get coordinated, they can actually have extremely impressive vertical jumps. So tall people with also very big, like one meter vertical jumps, um, that, that's elite volleyball. Um, so when it comes to their prioritizing you know, how to improve the vertical jump, you, you, I, I find it's important to, to have your criteria assessment. So for volleyball, that's going to be a spike jump and a, a counter movement jump. When you are doing a block or any a movement that doesn't involve an approach to the net, the counter movement jump, you can do it with two arms like a block if you like, uh, but the same thing is reflected by just doing a counter movement and reaching with one arm. So that's one of your main ones. And then an approach jump, which you let the athlete use three steps, four steps, however many steps that they use on the court. And just already having those two vertical jumps, maybe it's on a vertex, um, you, you already have something to compare. So what is the percentage difference gained from the approach? So if a, if a volleyball player has a, a vertical jump of, uh, say, 300, say, 330 centimeters on a counter movement, and then their approach is, you know, and they do an approach and it's 335, they're not getting a lot of additional gain from the horizontal approach. So then already you can start to look and break down, like, is this a technical factor? Is it that they don't have the knowledge of how to do it? 
or is there something physical or biomechanical? Is it the just simply there's something limiting their technique? Uh, and you can start to break that down further. Then from there, I would add in other assessments to further determine what their training should look like. Rather than just say, oh, you've got a 330 centimeter counter movement jump, uh, here's your training program. I, I need more information. I need to know, well, where is that coming from? So you could look at something like a drop jump. Are they getting additional jump height from a drop jump? So sticking with 330 centimeters as a counter movement jump, if they drop off a 20 centimeter box and their vertical jump is 325 centimeters, they're getting no additional gain from dropping. So that, that doesn't mean they're a bad person, but it does mean they've got pretty bad tolerance to the eccentric load, to the accentuated eccentric. And so it's not, you know, it's not something to get excited about, but it's also not something to get too upset about because it probably suggests that they, they have a great window of opportunity to begin working on stretch load tolerance. Maybe depth jumps are a good thing for them, or maybe they're not ready for depth jumps, but they do something that's like a regression from a depth jump, like a tuck jump or something that will start to develop that tolerance to the stretch load. And um, you know, with a volleyball population, I would go so far as to test their 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 centimeter drop jump. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a 14 year old who doesn't have a good training history, you might not do all of that. But with a national team, absolutely, because you might find that you have all these different profiles from different players, like I demonstrated in, in 2011 in that presentation where. I, I think I compared two, two volleyball players who had the same counter movement jump, but one of them was achieving their best drop jump height, you know, maybe plus 10 centimeters off of a 40 centimeter box, whereas the other on 40 centimeters, that was that was too challenging for them, so their their jump was lower. So you can kind of graph, graphically look at that and decide, well, one volleyball player might benefit from, from depth jumps from 20 centimeters, and one of them may want, need to do do for him. So it, it's a bit of a finest, philosophical question, but what you just outlined, you look at where are they weakest and then attack the weakness. What's mm. your take on strengthening the strengths yeah. or strengthening the weakness? That's a really that's a really good point. And it is I get I suppose it is a philosophical question. It is. It's something it's something that I've I've, I've chatted to a bunch of different people on and I guess um, in this case, um, I guess it is a weakness, but I, I don't necessarily look at it as targeting their weakness so much as looking where the, the most adaptation could occur from. So, yeah, yeah. So I do agree that from a, in a bigger picture sense, so we're talking about, you know, the volleyball player themselves and their role in the team, um, you know, ignoring your strengths and attacking your weaknesses as an individual philosophical philosophically speaking may not always be the right approach uh, so as an example um, I've had volleyball players who weren't very strong on a weight room setting but they were inherently explosive with their body so very good vertical jumps yet you would expect them to have a, a half decent strength in a weight room setting and they, they didn't, to be honest. They just didn't. So one approach that most people would take would be to attack the weakness and, and assume that the strength will be maintained. Um, but even though I work with snowboarding now, I have an example that I deal with every day with one of our snowboarders who... He is... He tests very, very well, and he snowboards very well, and he doesn't... Res if we work on his weaknesses... He doesn't respond very well. So I actually can't attack his weaknesses because it tears apart everything else that we're trying to do. He's, he's an extreme example. Yeah, for me, I haven't had a lot of that. Uh, with the volleyball player example, he wasn't very weight room strong, but it's not like when we did front squats and things like that that there was negative repercussions. It's not like his explosiveness disappeared. He had a great he had a great depth jump. He was amazing at plyometrics. 
I didn't need to give him a lot of additional stuff that he was good at because he seemed to be inherently good at that. Um, but when I gave him, you know, resistance training, it didn't make anything else worse. But in this case of this snowboarder, I can make him worse very quickly <laughs> by by saying he hasn't done much of that. I'm going to give him some of that, and like he responds to some. He responds to training in the weight room where we're focusing on say velocity of movement so he will he will and he can squat but when we put a lot of tension through his body and he squats a little slower like uh, a load that allows him to only move the bar at about 0.4 0.3 meters per second on average through the concentric part of the squat that the, the problems that come with that for him aren't worth the benefits that we gain from it but he can, we can work on, say, a load to, that he can move at 0 0.5, 0 0.6 meters a second and get him to move that faster. And then once he gets it to moving it quite fast, then we can increase the load and, and I don't ruin his snowboarding. Yeah. But yeah, we could go on forever on that philosophy for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's, let's draw it back a little bit. Uh, plyometric training program design. What are your progressions if you implement a general plyometric mm -hmm. program? And yeah, how would you approach the season? Sure. How would you yeah. Ever? Yeah, I think um, I, I kind of use a, an expression in my mind that helps me frame it as uh, I'm going to go athlete specific and make sure that the progressions are sport relevant. Mm -hmm. So I might have a volleyball player um, that I'm working with whose progressions for, for plyometrics are um, not not as aggressive as some people might think. They might say, well, he's a volleyball player, he should be doing more plyometrics, but because of, in addition to the jump profiling that I mentioned, we'll also do force plate profiling. And from that, I may actually be using very, very small doses of very, very specific style plyometrics that are only in there to complement say a heavy resistance training or a heavy ballistic training progression and then once I achieve a few things that I'm looking for there then I lay out the plyometric program meanwhile the player on the same team right beside him on court is right beside him in the weight room doing a completely different program so it's like these guys are on the same team and, I, and I, I'll, I'll say to coaches who are visiting seeing the huge disparity between one program and another is Yeah, they're both volleyball players, and they're both even in the same position. They have the same responsibilities on the team, but it's sport-relevant, but athlete-specific. So if we dive into that example, we might have one guy who has one plyometric exercise for a couple microcycles, maybe even for a couple mesocycles. And it might be that he's just doing accentuated eccentric uh, drop loads. So he's using, say, 30 kilograms total, 15 kilograms in each hand, descending into the jump, letting go of the load, explosively jumping up with his body weight. Um, he might be doing that because I want to uh, essentially manipulate that exchange between the draw and the jump in order to, if I overload that eccentric, I'll get a, a greater than normal uh, explosive you know, uh, explosive force. And I might be doing that to kind of teach him the motor aspect of the of the explosive transition because I'm giving him heavy strength training. And if I'm giving him heavy, heavy strength training at the same time, I kind of I, I kind of need to contrast it so that I don't bring him too far over to that slower, high tension, um, high force, lower velocity movement. I need to contrast it with something explosive. Another example would be I could pair them or make sure that I have uh, an overspeed jump in that program so that I don't lose or minimize that velocity side of things. Exactly, because I, I very much think of it like a continuum. I think many coaches do now. We see our exercises as continuums, but also the physical qualities as a continuum. Meanwhile, I may have, you know, this other exact, this other hypothetical athlete may not be, if he's not working a lot on that end of the continuum, I might have this guy here and this guy here, he might actually be doing a little bit on the high end of the continuum, um, you know, some, some high tension, lower speed, but higher, higher tension, high force work, 
but then he's actually working on that, you know, uh, hang cleans, hang snatches, loaded jump squats, um, and then even more over here. And the profile of that guy, that's kind of going to be your, um, your big strong, you know, white guy. Your big strong white guy from Canada or Australia um, who, uh, who, who's your, your guy that the strength coach loves because he can, uh, he, can, he can squat a lot, so you brag about him, and he can clean a lot, but he's, he's the second best for his position on the national team because his vertical jump is great, but it's not world class. And this, this guy, this type of guy, he may have a, a counter movement jump of 330 and a spike jump of 340, but then I've got a guy with a, a different different sort of background, different makeup. He's got a counter movement of 30, a spike jump of 370, you know, and when he drops off a box, he jumps over your head. Um, but he's front squatting 90 kilos, which is his body weight, and he's thinking that's really hard, you know? And so one guy can grind through the slower high tension, and he's comfortable in that space, and he's trying to move really fast, you know? So there's an example of that slower white guy where we're working on his, I wouldn't call it a weakness, we're working on his opportunity, um, but we're making sure we don't lose what also makes him, makes him pretty good. And if we're going back to the two examples you just outlined, so the strength guy, you normally you see it in the jump, mm -hmm. mechanics, you see it lower dip. Yeah. Yeah. And a longer push distance. A longer yeah. push distance, and the yeah. other one is more this plyometric yes. guy, shorter dip, but very bouncy. Generally speaking, yeah, generally speaking. So um, the, 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 the second example, the guy's using, you know, it's a high rate of, uh, of movement. Um, and, and, and the first example, the, the, and this is obviously not always, but in general terms, uh, the, the first example, the, 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 ten, the stronger in the weight room guy, they're favoring a longer length um, of, you know, stretch shortening cycle activity. So And both of them stimulate stretch shortening cycle activity. Of course. Yeah, the the rate at which you do it, as well as the range in which you do it. Mm. Yeah. I remember I was working with volleyball, and we had the same sort of kind of classified athletes into these two groups. Yeah, yeah. And then the question always stood out: Can you make the strength guy into a more of a twitchy guy? Mm -hmm. What's yeah. your take on that? Um, I don't know if you can make him more twitchy, but you can tap into the opportunity that they currently don't don't have um, and, and I say that with some level of confidence because I've been pretty lucky to be consistent with monitoring those those qualities so I can observe those changes so uh, the, the guy who's not so twitchy he might you know I mean, he might have that 330 centimeter vertical jump going back to that score um, and his depth jump off 20 centimeters is 325. Well, we can see we can get those guys to 335 off the dead jump, and what we'll often find is the counter movement jump goes up to 333. So they improve both scores, but with a severe bias towards the one that was kind of lacking. Like it, to me, it really stands out. If you drop off a box and you can't jump higher, I always say to them, don't, don't get depressed, get excited because we've just found something we can work on, and then they work on that quality. Um, and then how we might lay that out would be the guy, you know, the guy's not really got a drop height that's optimal. Because theoretically, you'd have a drop height where you get your best jump from that one. So then you philosophically ask, do we use that drop height? Is that what it means? Maybe. I don't know, though. I don't know for sure. But maybe we use that drop height in some a little bit higher. Or maybe there's ways to use lower drop heights but change the nature of the exercise like, um, like you know, uh, in some of Martin Bobert's um, work he talks about different classifications of drop jumps. I use two of Martin Bobert's proposed ones. One is where you emphasize the short contact. So I might use sh like lower heights for that. Yeah, he talks about bounce, drop jump, and yes. the second one is the um, terminology. He has a counter movement drop yeah, jump, yeah, and then he, I think he has a third one. Oh, is it? I was away off two. Okay. I'm not sure, yeah. For me, practically speaking, I just stick with two. Hmm. Um, and, and maybe that's what he was thinking too, but the bounce drop jump, I, I, I just 
you know, ex instruct the athletes that the idea is to just literally bounce off like a volleyball. So it's like, bang, that's what you're trying to do. I don't, I don't get too descriptive because I can confuse them. I just say to them, drop off the box and go bang like this, and I just drop a volleyball and bounce it quick. With the other one, I say I want you to drop off the box and find a way to jump as high as possible. Because if you tell them that, and that's the outcome they'll look for, they won't overthink it with what they do, or how much do I dip or whatever. They might ask me that question, how much am I supposed to dip? Figure it out, drop off the box, and do whatever you need to do to jump as high as possible. You might even put the vertex there for them to, to test it. So we might, we might use those two different types of drop jumps and layer it out. So we might, might start with lower heights and then you know monitor it and as they improve on those lower heights we we raise it so if they're they're uh if i think of say uh, a great volleyball player um you know the, the example i used igor Yudin, he's a professional player in um, poland i think he's still in poland igor might drop off a 40 or 50 centimeter box and get his best drop height okay and so then it, the, the question which i find fascinating is should I use that drop height for him? I would say, you know, if that's a good idea, if you accept that that's a good idea, then maybe use that height and one a little higher mm -hmm. in order to, to try to shift it even further. Mm -hmm. Having said that, though, Igor was such a good player and such an amazing jumper that maybe my role would be to do everything I can to make him handle his landings better. Yeah. Because the better the player, the more ball they're going to get from the setter in attack, um, the more time they're going to get on court. So perhaps figuring out how to extend his career so that he can have a career and provide for his family longer is the, my contribution. Yeah. Um, so again, philo philosophical approach. Comes back to our responsibilities as SNC coach, improving performance, preventing yeah. injuries. Exactly. Longer, yeah. For sure, for sure. Cause yeah, our contextual purpose is to win volleyball games. That, that, that's Igor's purpose. That, that must be our purpose. But at the same time, our overall purpose is to upgrade people's lives. And one of those lives that you can upgrade is the people you're working with. And so it may be, obviously, winning, winning games for the team is great for the individual as well. But um, teaching them how to take care of themselves is a big responsibility. And it's a legacy we can li leave. Um, you know, I live in Canada. Igor, as an example, lives in Poland, and I think part time in Australia still. He played for the Australian team. But um, you know, if I've taught him something that helps him now, tremendous amount of satisfaction here, not just here, yeah. to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, if he was if he was a piece of meat or someone just on a piece of paper, I'd look at that and say, geez, he's got an amazing drop jump, uh, 40 centimeters. I, I might be using 40 and 50. And then when I start to see improvements in the 40 and the 50, then I can be confident that we might move to 45, 55, or 50, and even 60. But I would always be, I would always layer in higher drop landings. So for landings refers to absorbing and yeah. sticking. Yeah. So okay. for for example, this you know this this amazing explosive freak like an Igor, they might be doing uh, bounce drop jumps off 20 or 30 centimeters in the same microcycle as doing 40 and 50 centimeter drop jumps for maximum height, as well as doing 60 and centimeter drop landings where we're working on um, stabilizing quickly but landing softly. Yeah. How would you sequence these exercises in a session? Do you start with absorbing force first or do you start with the most explosive stuff first? Good question. We would warm up the height to the absorbing force, so we would do stuff not from drop heights, so just you know, uh, drop squats, where you're just squatting and then drop and stabilize, double leg, single leg. Um, I like to do some basic gymnastics with almost every sport I work with. Mm -hmm. Obviously with snowboarding and surfing, there's a lot of direct applications, but even with volleyball players. Um, so doing things like um, a forward roll and then re-stabilizing on your feet is, yeah. a, is, a, basic, is a basic thing. Um, and not too irrelevant for their backcourt play, where they might have to, you know, dig a ball and then, you know, dig a ball on an angle and then roll efficiently. Because one of the hardest physiological things in, in volleyball in terms of physiology from a central is actually getting up off the ground when you're a really yeah. big person.
Um, so they have a high jumping load, you know, thousands of jumps per week, um, and we focus on that too. But they may only, in practice and competition, they may only dive about 150 or 200 times. But they're really big people, so getting up off the ground is actually hard. So if you can teach them to actually roll better and be a bit more gymnastics in how they recover their body weight from digging a ball uh, or chasing a ball and, and, and trying to bring it back into play, uh, that helps too because it's less stressful for them. So, so we might do absorptions like that, and then they might have their drop landings. Um, we might also do the drop landings at the end of training, just under a bit of under a bit of fatigue sort of depends and that's kind of for me like a bit of the art and science yeah. you go not so much instinct but where do I put this for this individual um, and that's kind of a fun decision to make to, to switch it up I do the same thing with our balance training sometimes it's after the warm up but before we do our main training mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's at the end to challenge them under a bit of fatigue Okay, Jeremy, we have to go back to our next session, I guess. Okay. So yeah. thanks for your time. That no was worries. great. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. We, I'd like to continue that cool. talk again. Yeah. Do it online. Sweet. Okay. That would be great. Cool. Right thanks on. a lot. Yeah, no worries.